Okay, I'm here with my favorite medical oncologist, Dr. Lockhart. Craig, can you introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, I'm Craig Lockhart. I'm a medical oncologist um, at the Medical University of South Carolina. I'm also division chief for hematology oncology. I've been doing GI cancers for about 20 years, and I'm excited to be with you, Brian. Thank you. My mother would be proud. Um, you know, I like doing this, and I like to find this thing called five questions. And I saw a lot of great uh, Twitter activity about some abstracts at ASCO. And I want to get into one a little bit particular, a little bit down the road. But I first, you know, I always think it's fun when you're dealing with the gastric esophageal cancer. It depends on whose office they come into as to what treatment modality or how they get treated. I was wondering if you could tell me what you thought the strengths and weaknesses were for patients with gastric esophageal cancer who get flock chemotherapy paradigms. So flock chemotherapy has been around for a few years, but it came, came to prominence when the FLOT4 study was um, published and presented a, a few years ago. So it's the strategy behind that is giving perioperative chemotherapy. So chemotherapy before surgery, chemotherapy after surgery. The strengths of it are that Number one, it's it's pretty potent chemotherapy in that if somebody has, if you're worried about systemic disease in someone, you're going to get, um, you're, you're giving that cancer a good hit as far as you're really hitting that cancer hard with the chemotherapy that you're giving. The weaknesses of it are that it can be toxic for some patients and um, it's you do have to have some experience with it to be able to manipulate the doses and the schedules to try to get patients through that regimen. It can be a challenge. So let's go in a little bit different direction. Flot's one side of the spectrum. What happened if we look at the other direction and we try, you know, a little bit of a cross regimen based on radiation therapy, involved so, radiation therapy? Yes. Yeah. So the cross, again, was based on the, the idea that giving patients chemotherapy and radiation therapy before surgery was beneficial. And that, and that had been thought for a long time and cross is one of the, actually one of the first big studies that actually met its you know accrual goals to actually prove that now the good things about it are that you do see what we call pathological complete response when you do chemotherapy and radiation therapy because the chemotherapy sensitizes the tumors to the radiation so we get to see that you get some pathological complete responses so some patients when you do the surgery there's no tumor left and that's fantastic that's a great result um, it's also well tolerated. Um, the chemotherapy is given every week. And so you're really keeping a close eye on these patients. And so um, it's pretty well tolerated. And the, you know, so overall, that's pretty good. The downside with CROSS is that the chemotherapy is relatively low dose. So we don't believe that we're doing a whole lot to the cancer itself outside of where you're actually aiming the radiation. So anybody has, you know, lymph nodes that are outside the radiation port or potentially sort of tumor cells circulating around, you're probably not hitting them very hard because the chemotherapy is relatively light. And I would also add from a radiation oncologist perspective, the radiation dose they used in CROSS is not what we kind of use here in the US. That, that's correct, so the 41.4, and um, it's a little bit lower than what we use in the US quite often, which is you all use what, 50 point, 50 point something. Yeah, 50.4, but I use 50s because it's easy for me to count by twos instead of 1.8s, you know? Okay. Um, but, you know, the thing that was, uh, I think, caused a lot of us to, you know, look at ASCO, and I thought one of the, you know, big abstracts that I saw presented was a study that compared, you know, FLOT versus CROSS. You want to tell us your thoughts on that? Yeah. So the the interesting study that was presented during the, plus, during the plenary session was the ESOPEC study, and it was comparing FLOT versus CROSS. Now, since that study was designed, there have been a few nuances, you know, added, especially added to the cross end where patients who have any kind of residual cancer, re, you know, receive adjuvant immunotherapy after a while. So the current study design did not include immunotherapy. So the head to head was something that we've anticipated for a long time. And um, it was interesting to see the results actually manifested this way. And so it looks based on the results of that clinical trial that the FLOT, the perioperative strategy we're giving chemotherapy before and after, outperformed the the you know the the cross study, and so overall, it suggests that we should change our standard of care to consider perioperative FLOT um, as the way to treat patients with 
GE junction and esophageal cancer. So I get that. I'm not going to argue with you or twist your arm or arm wrestle you over this. Um, what do you think some things that surprised you in that study that you would have expected a little bit different? Like I, I'm trying not to lead you too much. Um, and I will it. give you what you want to hear, which is, I think, you know, the survival with plot was so much better. It's hard to say cross could not be um, used currently unless it's a squam, okay? Because yeah. uh, flot was only for, the, the study was only for adenos. But, you know, how did the cross study could have uh, improved better? Or what were the flaws yeah. in the cross regimen? So the, you know, look, when you compare how cross, the cross regimen performed in this study versus the cross regimen performed in the cross study, I mean, it underperformed. I would say when you look at the the number of pathological complete responses, and again, you talked about the survival data as well, that um, CROSS seemed to underperform in this particular recent clinical trial. Now, it's a randomized study, and so you could you you, you have to take the results as what they are. In the cross, I'm study, not arguing the results. In the, in the cross I'm study, gonna say in the original, in the original cross study, did CROSS overperform? I mean, who knows? But the um, but in this study, I would say CROSS didn't seem to represent itself very well. And so, um, you know, the, the results were not as robust as I was expecting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the other problem with the cross was that, you know, only like two thirds of the patient got the full regiment, you know, that, even that, the 41 grade, but- I agree, what, that, that, that was a little unexpected as well. Considering how well that regimen tends to be tolerated, that was yeah. a little unexpected as well. But when I think you looked at the median survival uh, between the two arms, and I'm as a radiation oncologist is saying this, Flot double cross, and it's hard to argue that. And I, I admit it, you know, uh, so to speak. So I think I'm going to answer this question with you, and because this was question four, I do think for adenos of the GE junction um, and the esophagus, the standard of care treatment should be flot. Would you disagree with me? I don't disagree. What I would say is that patients have to have good performance status, and um, because again, flot. Flot is not not an easy thing to do, but as I said, the more experience you get with it, the you know the more you're able to to recognize the toxicities ahead of time and try to adjust accordingly. So I would say patients with good performance status that um, you're one hundred percent certain that this is a good surgical candidate, um, and adenocarcinomas again of the GE junction and and the distal esophagus. I would definitely that's definitely going to be my standard of care. So I'm going to make up a question right here just to throw it in there. If they came through surgery after FLOT and had a positive margin, would you endorse using immunotherapy and a checkpoint inhibitor? With a positive margin after surgery, I would definitely want to employ radiation therapy as part of the post-operative strategy, assuming that we could find, you know, find the, the margin and, and locate it and do radiation. I would do radiation there probably with chemotherapy concurrent with it. And then after that, yeah, I would, I would probably consider immunotherapy thereafter. But as I said, it would be extrapolating from our known prior studies and uh, making a, a few little a few little leaps with the data. Okay, we may have to negotiate that one. Absolutely. Uh, but let me, we'll get into that in another session, I guess. Yeah. Here's my last question for you. Um, what clinical trials should we now be considering for these patients? And in what direction do you see care for these patients moving uh, in the future? Yeah, so, you know, some years ago, we used to do this thing where patients used to undergo induction chemotherapy. Then they did chemo radiation therapy. And induction chemotherapy actually fell out of favor because the, the results were not as expected, not as good as expected. However, chemotherapy is better now. And I, that's looks like that's going to be the way to go again. They're, they're wanting to, we need to consider doing induction chemotherapy followed by chemotherapy and radiation therapy, um, you know, in those patients. And then also incorporating immunotherapy. Does immunotherapy work better when radiation is part of the treatment strategy versus just being part of a chemotherapy, a perioperative chemotherapy strategy? So the questions to be answered right now, you know, would be the, the optimal um, sort of sequencing of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Should radiation therapy be a part of the plan? And also should immunotherapy be a part of the plan? And, and if so, when? 
um, when the radiation therapy is ongoing, when after surgery, um, those kinds of things. Those are the questions that remain to be answered just, just surrounding this particular uh, clinical trial result. What do you think about the potential for organ preservation? I think that's a, that's a, that's excellent. I, I, you know, when we think about the PCR, the pathological complete response, when you saw those kinds of things with cross, it then, you know, sparked your interest. You know, if we could increase the path CR um, significantly, could we then do a watchful waiting um, after doing chemotherapy and radiation therapy? So it's a, it's something that I'm very interested in. And I think now with some of the strategies that we have with circulating tumor DNA, that we can actually monitor uh, circulating tumor DNA, and we can you could do something similar to what we're trying to do with colorectal cancers, in that you could do what we consider definitive therapy, and then you could monitor them for circulating tumor DNA to see whether um, there's can active cancer or not. If there's not active cancer, and you've done endoscopies, and you've done the appropriate biopsies, could you do watchful waiting? Absolutely, and I do think that that is a a strategy that I would love to to see us investigate further. Hey. It's Friday. It's time to get out of here, but I think I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and I really enjoyed doing this. Hopefully we can do more in the future. Absolutely, Brian. You have a good weekend as well. Hey, stay safe and take care, everyone. Thank you.